Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the gifts that you give to us. Thank you especially for the gift of your Son and his life, and in particular this evening, for the gift of his passion and his death. Jesus, thank you for, for dying for us. <coughs> Holy Spirit, fill our hearts, guide our hearts and our minds tonight as we seek your truth. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you.
chapter 18, starting with verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Judas, Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, preparing a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to befall him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing there with them. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word which he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. The slave's name was Marcus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the chalice which the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the maid who kept the door and brought Peter in. The maid who kept the door said to Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers, officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all, the Jews, well, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is this how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and they said to him again, Are you not one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of, his, one of the servants of the high priest, a kinsman of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the cock crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was early. They themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was to fulfill the word which Jesus had spoken, to show by what death he was to die. Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Jesus answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingship is not from this world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no crime in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but 
Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and clothed him in a purple robe. They came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing you him out to you, that you may know that I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was even more afraid. He entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Upon this, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in, on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, and in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place to the place called the place of the skull, which is in he called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote the title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests of the Jews then said to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also for his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and this, the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the preparation day, the day of preparation, in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for that that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place, the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. 
And again, another scripture says, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who had at first come to him by, at, by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and olives, about a hundred pounds weight. They took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new, new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of the Lord. Okay, um, yeah, somehow we're going to talk about all that. I guess maybe the first thing before we get going, um, looking at the differences and similarities between what we just read, what we just heard, and the synoptic things. And specifically, I'm going to be looking at and talking about the Gospel of Mark. Because as we recall, um, the synoptic accounts are primarily, we think, all of them contain elements from Mark, and we suspect that Mark was the first one written. Okay, the other thing, again, maybe you remember this from when we were going through Mark last year, if you weren't, spoiler, spoiler alert, um, Mark, uh, who was, of course, a very good friend of Simon Peter, is most likely writing his gospel from the perspective of Simon Peter. It's also more of kind of like, I've heard it referred to as kind of like the home video gospel. There's not really a lot of like editing, you know, going on in it. It's just like the guy walking around the camcorder, like checking everything. Um, and that's kind of how the Gospel of Mark reads. Like, for example, you just walk around with the camcorder filming everything happening at the birthday party. Right, so it's, it's, it's kind of like almost raw, unedited footage of everything, whereas John, um, has put a lot more thought into this. This is probably written much later, at least a decade or two later, maybe several decades later. He's put a lot more thought into this, a lot more prayer. He's kind of trying to see some of these other theological nuances. Um, and I'm not saying that then he's changing his story. I'm not saying that. He's remembering the story. He's looking at Peter's account, written by Mark, and then again, by Matthew and Luke, and adding in the other stuff that maybe Peter left out. Or, seeing some of the other ways that these are tying in symbolically and theologically, and emphasizing them more than we're emphasizing just as they went through. Does that kind of make sense? So, the thing is, and the main thing to take away though, is that actually there are more similarities than there are differences. Most of the things in Matthew, Mark, and Luke also show up in John. John sometimes dedicates more verses to talking about it, which again goes back to, it's not like, oh, he's adding something. No, 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 no. It means he was an eyewitness. He's recalling the extra details that Peter didn't write down because Peter wasn't there. He was. And so sometimes, you know, Mark will have like one verse or two verses talking about something, and John will have like four or eight describing the same scene. There's other things that Mark relates it one way, John relates it a different way. So we'll get a couple of those really quickly. Some of the differences, because really what it comes down to, is like I said, the overall, it's very, very similar. Um, the main difference is the difference of emphasis. Okay, and again, this goes all the way back to remember our first session talking about John. And maybe you remember we talked about the difference between high and low Christology. Is this ringing any bells? Okay, actually, that's kind of good because I was going to talk about some other stuff that we brought up in the first class too. Low Christology, you can remember, is this kind of starting from the point of Jesus is human. And over the course of the gospel, we discover that he's God. High Christology, this is the oversimplified version again. We start from the perspective of Jesus is divine. And over the course of the gospel,
course of the story, we discover he's actually also one of us. And so it's basically, when we say high and low, we don't mean one's better or worse, we just mean we're coming from different, we're going different directions, coming from different starting places. So the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are written from a low Christology perspective, where the disciples are kind of uncovering who Jesus is over the course of the story. Here in John, the very first verse, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We already know how the story ends, right from the beginning. And the passion narratives reflect that. So the passion narrative in synopsis, specifically in Mark, like I said most of this I'm talking about Mark, the emphasis is on the suffering of Jesus Christ. The emphasis is very, very much on Jesus Christ suffering and dying for our sins. In John, Yes, Jesus dies for our sins, but the emphasis is on the glory of Jesus Christ revealed on the cross. Yes, he's suffering, but it is his glory. When we call it the book of glory, we're not talking, it doesn't mean the ascension. We're not talking about Jesus being at the right hand of the Father. We call it the book of glory because for John, the glory of Jesus Christ takes place when he is lifted up on the cross. When he's dying for our sins, that is when Jesus' glory is revealed. And for him again, and so the same for us, it's all considered one whole. It's one holistic event. Last Supper, Upper Room, Garden of Gethsemane, the, um, the betrayal, the agony in the garden, the interrogation, Scourging, the crown of thorns, the carrying of the cross, the crucifixion, dying on the cross, stabbed to the side, buried, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven, you know, all of that, that every, well, in the ascension, we'll do separately, but all those other things are wrapped up into one holistic event for John. It's one thing. And all of that together is his glory. The glory of God revealed, but in a particular way, His glory is revealed on the cross, and that goes back to something that, for the sake of time, we had to skip over. But if those of you guys who are taking notes, John 12, 32. And Jesus says, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And John indicates in the next verse that Jesus said this to indicate the way he was going to die. In other words, when he says, when I lift it up, he is not talking about the ascension. And in fact, he couldn't be because, he, of course, he ascends to heaven on his own power. When I am lifted up, I will draw all humanity to myself. And John says he was saying this to indicate the way he was going to die. The glory of Jesus Christ happens when he is lifted up from the earth on the cross. And so for John, his emphasis is always on Christ's glory. Not the suffering. Yes, clearly he's suffering. But it's how God's glory, how the glory of Jesus Christ is revealed through all of it. So here's a quick little rundown. Agony in the garden shows up in the synoptics. John. Nope. You hear about any sweating blood or... No, you didn't hear that. I did say they were there. They said they were praying. None of that, though. No agony in the garden. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But again, John is emphasizing the glory, not the suffering. The kiss of Judas. We think back to the other things where Jesus is betrayed by the kiss of one of his disciples. Nope. Not John. It says Judas brings all the guys there and it says Jesus goes out to meet them. He goes out to meet them. And again, does this mean, well, someone's lying? No. And actually, I think, for those who have ever seen Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, I think he does a good job of kind of marrying these accounts when they differ and showing how both of these things could have been happening at the same time. Where Jesus is both initiating the conversation with the men coming up, and Judas also could have come up and, and kissed.
missed him to show them who he was. But in the Gospel of John, John recounts how Jesus initiates his own arrest. Wrap your head on that. By the way, all of these things we're going to see over here with John, this goes back to remember when we were talking about the Good Shepherd? I am the Good Shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep. There's another couple of verses there that I don't think we spend as much time on, where Jesus says, No one takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. And I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it back up. And over and over again in the Gospel of John, that's what we're seeing. That Jesus is laying down his own life freely. That Jesus is the one initiating these things. He's the one pushing the action. In a sense, almost forcing the hand of Caiaphas and Annas and the, the high priest. He's forcing the hand of Pontius Pilate. He's the one pushing the action forward. And over and over again, we see that. He's the one who keeps pushing it forward, kind of forcing them to crucify him. So he goes up there, and he's the one who initiates his own arrest here. Um, in the synoptics, we hear about how the disciples are scared, and they all run away. In John, I'm going to actually go back and read this, because it's so cool. It's that cool. Whom do you seek? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. In the synoptics, the disciples are scared and run away. In John, Jesus is so in control of the situation, the soldiers coming to arrest him almost run away. I am he. He's in complete control. There's no way there. He's laying down his life freely. So here, the people coming to arrest him are the ones who are scared. I'm going to get some of this mixed up. Oh, and uh, I actually left like this one off up here, but in Mark, I don't know if it was Simon Peter's embarrassment, or maybe Mark trying to be nice to his mentor, but it just says, one of the disciples of Jesus cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. John does a whole bunch. He's like, yeah, Peter did it. <laughs> Very likely Peter would have been already you know, martyred for several years at that point, so he probably thought there was no point in hiding that anymore. But Mark, perhaps a spare Peter, said one of the followers of Jesus cut off the ear of a servant of the high priest. John, to emphasize that he was really there, said, nope, it was Peter who did it. And the guy's name is Malchus. I was saying, if you doubt this, you can go back and go and ask, ask Malchus. Of course, we know that Jesus also healed Malchus too. So I think there's a tradition. I wouldn't be surprised to find out that he was one of the early Christians as well. There's that. Uh, in the Synoptics, Jesus appears before the Sanhedrin. And John, he disappears before Annas and Caiaphas, which is the high priest. Or the high priest, the high priest, father in law, who was like the last high priest. It was a little confusing. Also, here, and here's where it gets really important. In the synoptics in Mark, we hear that Jesus is silent to be born his accusers. But the most he ever says is he goes up to Pilate and says, Oh, are you a king? Are you the king of Jews? And he said, You say so. That's it. That's all he says. And the only thing he says to the high priest in the Sanhedrin in Synopsis is a messianic claim that he is the son of that he is the son of the Most High, and that they will see him ascending on the clouds of heaven. Which, and this is important, file this away for about I don't know, ten to twenty minutes later, depending on how quickly they're going to talk. This is a High priest explains his clothes. He tears his clothes. You've heard what he said. 
What's your verdict? Death. Crucified. Blasphemy. He's a blasphemer. That happens in Mark. Jesus remains silent except for like basically two statements. In John, we hear him defending himself. Again, he's in control. He's pushing it. He's forcing them to take action against him. He's also, I think, offering them a chance for repentance. I think he's trying to convince Pontius Pilate to come around. Not because he's trying to get out of being crucified, but because he's worried about Pontius Pilate's soul. I'm saying this out loud, it's hard for me to kind of get my, my mind around that. This man, you know he's going to crucify you. And you're trying to bring your repentance, you're trying to inspire him to follow the truth. I, I can't even picture that. In the Synoptics, Peter is denying Jesus separate from everything that's going on. So, is it Luke, I think, he denies Jesus before he's questioning that St. Adrian. In Matthew and Mark, it's right afterwards. And it's all just kind of being done in one chunk. Here in John, you guys catch how it got broken up. It's kind of going on as Jesus is getting questioned. In the synopsis, it says that after it happens, he remembers the word of Jesus and Roger rushes out and cries bitterly. Here, there's more of this kind of sense that this is going on while Jesus is right there watching him. It doesn't say that, but there's, that's more of the sense that this is going on concurrently. We'll get to some of the elements here, but here's the uh, last kind of big, big thing here in terms of the, the major differences. Um, the wine mixed with myrrh that we read about in Mark that is offered to Jesus, but says he does not drink it. In John, it says there's a bowl of vinegar. And Jesus says, I thirst. Once again, kind of pushing the action. <coughs> and by the way, if we also think about that, we don't have time to talk about cups and chalices and thirsting and stuff like that, unfortunately. But it is kind of interesting that over and over and over again he's talking about the passion, especially in John. Jesus refers to it as this chalice. So shall I, when James and John say, hey, we want to sit at your right, your left, your kingdom, what does he ask them? He says, can you drink from the chalice? that I'm going to drink from. And later on, I think it was also in John chapter 12, he says, what shall I do? Jesus? He says, should I turn away the chalice that God has prepared for me, that my Father has given to me? Shall I reject it? Not in John, but in the synoptics, what is he praying in the agony of the garden? What is he praying in Gethsemane? Let this cup, let this chalice, What? Pass from me. But not my will be yours to be done. So here, at the height of his passion, minutes before breathing his final breath, Jesus says, I thirst. Thirsty for souls? Yes. Thirsty for our love? Yes. Also thirsty for his own passion. Thirsty for the suffering that God the Father had for him. He didn't drink the vinegar heavily. He said he, he, said he took a sponge, right? If I'm remembering what we just read. The sponge stuck on like a sticker spear. What, did, what was it? You guys catch with the branch was? Hissa. Well, that's bizarrely specific. 
Why is it? That shows up. Shh, you're not saying it. You, you like how press say you're not going to answer it. Okay. Okay, so Hissa is bizarrely specific. We hear about Hissa branches a long time ago in the scriptures. Around the book of Exodus, in fact. What was it for? It's for Passover. The first Passover, the Jews were told to take the blood of the Passover lamb and mark their doorposts with a hyssop branch. He came in the And now at the cross, Jesus says, I thirst. And perhaps this is the last part of that chalice to fulfill all the scriptures. And it's given to him with his approach. He's again pushing the action. He is doing this. And again, this idea of laying down his own life and bring, raising it back up again. And there's something else here. There's a little hint here, although it's never completely explicit. Something that the author of Hebrews is going to pick up on. And that is Jesus as the high priest. Here we see, because of course we remember from the very, 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 very beginning of the gospel, John the Baptist, he sees Jesus from a distance, and you remember what he cries out? Well, I do because I say it every single Mass. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because there is no J in Latin. 
And you would know that if you have seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. <laughs> I-N-R-I. So that's just the Latin form. Now there's something significant about this though, because in the synoptics, it's meant as a kind of a mockery. Pontius Pilate puts it up, there's one last way to mock Jesus. Here, I'm not saying he actually believed it, but he seems a lot more adamant about keeping it up there. There isn't this whole thing, like, there's like, I think, one or two verses dedicated to it in the synoptics. There's about four, I think it's four in John. And it really emphasizes the fact that Pilate has no intention of backing down from what he wrote. John also says, that's how we know that it was written not just in I-N-R-I, but that it was actually written out in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. That's significant. Because what it means is that everyone who walked by the cross of Jesus Christ would have been able to read it. Hebrew, Hebrew is the language of theology in that part of the world. Greek was the language of culture. Latin was the language of politics. So this is kind of a universal theme here going on, isn't there? Everyone can read it. Not just that, but it also kind of shows that Jesus Christ is meant to be king of everybody. He is not just the king of our theology, he is also the king of culture and the king of politics and the king of everything else in between. He is meant to be king over all of these things. It's not one of these things we do for an hour on a Sunday and then we put it on the bookshelf or hide in the closet and put a Persian fur rug over it and forget about it for six and a half days. It is meant to be a part of everything. Now, oh, by the way, is this significant? Isn't it significant that let me finish the question first? <laughs> the person who is announcing this is a Gentile. Is a pagan Gentile, and oh by the way, not just any pagan Gentile, but he is a representative representative of the most powerful man on earth. He is the voice of Caesar in that part of the world. And he's making this announcement. And then when the Jewish religious leaders come up and say, you got to change the sign, he says, what I've written, I've written. For whatever reason, that kind of always makes me think of the old runner from the Ten Commandments. So let it be written. So let it be done. I can't do the old runner except, but he's, he's a great actor. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can watch the Ten Commandments. Charlton has seen the old runner one Says. What I've written, I've written. So this is great testimony being given by a pagan Gentile and a representative of Caesar. Now speaking of Caesar, because I actually want to back back up a little bit, there are one or two other things that I really wanted to point out that I totally forgot about until just now. First, we are back to way back to, to Gethsemane. Remember that question that I told you guys to remember way back in the first week we did this? Of course you don't. <laughs> Jesus turns around and he sees two disciples, two of John the Baptist's disciples. We decided that one was Andrew, and I think remember we decided the other was probably John himself. So we're going to say it was John and Andrew chasing after Jesus. After John the Baptist said, Behold the name of God, who takes away sins of the world, they stray after him. Because they're looking for the Messiah. And Jesus turns around and he says, What are you looking for? What are you looking for? I told you to remember that question. You remember it next week too. Because we're going to hear that question again. Whom do you seek? In other words, what are you looking for? This time, they know who, they know what they're looking for, but for all the wrong reasons. Something to think about. These questions are going to pop up some more. So, again, remember that for next week, too. Where'd that other thing go here? Um, okay, two quick things. 
things. First, Barabbas. Does it bother anybody else that we were stupid enough to ask for Barabbas? And I say we, because every Palm Sunday, every Passion Sunday, guess what? You and I get to holler out, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. By the way, it's supposed to hurt. Say it. It's supposed to hurt to say those words. That's why we say them. Because every time I sin, I'm screaming them all over again. That's not all sin happening, by the way. I figure after a 20 minute gospel proclamation, that you keep the homily short. <laughs> Does it bother anyone else, though? By the way, did it, have you guys ever looked at Barabbas' name before? Barabbas. The son of the father. His name literally means the son of the father. Yeah. Remember we're told that we have spirit of sonship, by which we call God Abba? Sons of the Father, the real one and the phony. We choose the phony, not that one. Give us the rest. Don't give us the real thing. Don't give us love and truth and life. Don't give us the good shepherd. Don't give us the light of the world. Don't give us the resurrection and the life. Give us the robber, the murderer, the insurrectionist. Dare I translate it a little more than we for common promise today? Give us the terrorist. Yeah, well, what do you think an insurrectionist was? Give us the terrorist. We pick the terrorist over the face of love. That's what we scream with our hearts and actions every time we sin. Lastly, before we go back into these other kind of signs and descriptions and stuff, did you guys hear what the priest said when they were at using on that whole repartee thing with Pilate? We have no king. But Caesar. That is wrong on so many levels. For a Jew, period. But especially for the high priest. If we really flash back far enough, we remember that in the days of the judges, before the kings of Israel, the whole reason. Why the Israelites did not have a king was because God Himself was supposed to be their king. God was their king. That's why Moses wasn't King Moses. That's why Joshua wasn't King Joshua. That's why Caleb didn't become King Caleb. That's why Samuel was a prophet and a judge, not King Samuel. They were never meant to be kings. The only king they were supposed to have was God Himself. Here now, a few thousand years later, I don't know, maybe a thousand or whatever, several centuries, we'll go with that. Several centuries later, the high priest of Israel is saying, We have no king but Yahweh. No, we have no king but Caesar. Let me take this moment to remind everyone here, Caesar was considered a god by the Gentile pagans. Why were Christians later on going to be martyred? Well, for one thing, because we weren't offering sacrifice to Caesar. Say we have no God but Caesar, excuse me, no king but Caesar, is 
essentially what my little slip of the tongue was there. We accept him as a political ruler, as our political head, but we are willing to even compromise our souls on this one. That's how much they hated Jesus. They were willing to at least go through the motions and give lip service to Caesar as king and God and Lord. Right? By the way, this is also why Christians got in trouble because we were later on going to say Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord is a title reserved for Caesar. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the title reserved for Caesar. Now, in Jesus' case, it's true. In Caesar's case, it isn't. Jesus is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Our King is Jesus. We have no King Caesar. The limit they were willing to go to make sure that they killed Jesus is a little horrifying. And it started small. I've been pretty sure Caiaphas did not wake up one morning and say, You know what? Don got it. I'm going to go tell a Roman governor that I have no king but Caesar. Because we don't usually start off our compromises that way. We compromise on the little things. And we let the little resentments and the little bitternesses grow and fester. And we let that unforgiveness fester. We resist the will of God in these other small ways. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves in a situation where, like, I have no king but Caesar. I have no God but Caesar. It's very tragic. If you if we really think about what he was saying there, it's tragic that a high priest of Israel, even if he didn't really believe it, could have gotten to the point where he was willing to say that to have an enemy killed. Okay, back to the house. There's one other thing I want to really quickly talk about, or actually maybe two other things. Certainly one other thing, but definitely two. Sorry to make this sense. We're we'll talking about this the seamless road, okay? Um, so it talks about the, the garments of Jesus being divided, they cast off my clothing. By the way, Jesus doesn't say in Loi Eloi Lana Sabakani in John. Did you guys catch that? There's like a fancy term which I don't remember exactly what it is, but he's quoting Psalm 22. Right? In the interest of time, I'm not going to read that tonight, but you need to. Read Psalm 22 next to the Passion. If that does not horrify you, you need to check your pulse. And I'm not kidding. What Psalm 22 describes is exactly what was happening at the cross on Good Friday. With terrifying accuracy. I'll leave it at that. So read Psalm 22 at some point, but one of the parts of Psalm 22 it talks about the castles from my come from my clothing. This is happening right there. So that's what John is referencing. Now, John makes a very a point that is missed in the synoptics that uh, it was seamless. What's that all about? Well, there are two interpretations. I don't think, well, maybe three, but two big ones. They are not mutually exclusive. Okay? So if you were to ask me which one do I think is true, I would tell you my favorite answer, which is yes. It's a both, I think it's a both and thing. So there's two basic ways of looking at this, um, two, two major ways of looking at why seamless wrote, why emphasis. The first is something that John doesn't spend most of the rest of the gospel talking about, which is why some people don't necessarily like it, but it works and it fits. And that is, it is a sign of Christ's priesthood. 
the priest wore a seamless garment. It was a garment made out of a single piece of fabric. So when the high priest is offering sacrifice, he is wearing a single piece of fabric that is seamless. And here we have Jesus. Remember, he said, I am laying down my life, I am, I am laying down my life for Jesus. Like I have the power to lay my life down, I have the power to take it up again. He's acting as both priest and victim here. John is emphasizing that he's both priest and victim, although he's not specifically talking priesthood. And here we see that one of the garments they're dividing up in Castle Gospel is what we would call a priestly garment. That's the short version of that. The other interpretation of that is the unity of the church. Jesus in John 17 prayed for unity among his followers. <coughs> Heavenly Father, may they be one even as you and I are one. By the way, that verse haunted me when I was younger. It's the big reason why I'm Catholic. Because I couldn't bring myself to believe that the Heavenly Father would ignore the prayer of the perfect Son of God a few hours before he laid down his life. I just couldn't bring myself to believe that God would have somehow forgotten about that prayer. And we believe in the oneness and the unity of the church, the big C church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that universal church, but also the mystical body of Christ. The unity there. And in fact, I think the verb that they use here, let's not tear it, is a verb that shows up elsewhere in the New Testament when talking about schisms. Let's, you know, tearing apart of the body of Christ. I think it's like schizo or schizo or something. I decided to spray you guys with Greek this week. But it's the same, similar verb, the same verb, used elsewhere in the New Testament talking about the tearing of the body of Christ, the schisms of the body of Christ. Let's not tear it, let's not schism it. And so we can say there's a kind of allegorical meaning referring to the unity of the body of Jesus Christ. Speaking of the body of Jesus Christ, give me a second. This is much better, and I'm sorry, I didn't realize until after I'd written the other side that the purple pen was about 30,000 times better than the blue one. So you can actually read this. This is a little bit of a refresher of kind of what we talked about some on the first week, but now that we're here at kind of the climax of it all, I thought it would be a good time to refresh this and hit it again. Because there were one or two points that I forgot the first time we went over it, and the other ones are worth talking about again. It's the comparison of John and Genesis. He's talking about the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. Because, again, you have that very, very almost funny. You have to come straight and say, wait, see anything disrespectful there? I'm talking about when he sees his mother at the foot of the cross. He says, Woman, behold your son. Just as that the wedding of Cana, Jesus is drawing attention to something very, very important. He's drawing attention to the fact that he is instituting a new creation. That he is making all things new. As he will say again later on in Revelation, he said, Behold, I make all things new. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now we have some other comparisons here. So if we think back to that first episode, the fall, who were the major characters? Back way back to Genesis. Not a trick question. Who were they? 
Adam? In the serpent. Okay. Actually, what I wrote down, because I wasn't even thinking initially, what you guys said, there was actually a mistake there. Adam, the woman, and the serpent. She hasn't been named yet. In kind of biblical thought, to name someone, to give a name to someone, shows that you are their master. I don't see that control over, but that you are above them. This is why Adam is given the authority to name all of the animals. But when Eve shows up, he says, this is woman, for she came out of man. But he does not name her, yet. Presumably because he's waiting for God to give her a name. And so at that point, when that happens, it is Adam, the woman, and the serpent. She becomes Eve later on. We'll get to that in a second. But right now, she's just the woman. Those are the characters. The action takes place. Of course, there's two trees. There's the tree of life, and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And without going way into the weeds, the tree of knowledge of good and evil really is more of a way of saying that we determine what is right and wrong, not God. The tree of life is put in the center of the garden, and then they're told, by the way, that other tree way over there, don't, don't eat it. But the tree of life is placed in the center. They find themselves over by this tree for some reason, the tree of knowledge of good and evil for whatever reason. But here's the thing. We'll back up then. That's, that's the action. The day of the fall. We'll get to that. First, the woman, we remember, comes from Adam's side. Remember? It says that Adam is cast into a deep sleep, that God opens up his side and pulls out one of his ribs and fashions woman from the side of man. By the way, what day does that happen? What day of the week? It's the sixth day, right? Adam's created the sixth day, seventh, sixth day. So what day of the week is that? Friday. Oh, 
purpose for existence was to lay down his life for his bride. To freely lay down his life for his bride. And the irony is, is that even the serpent, and sometimes I think you can translate the word that serpent there, to be this like really venomous serpent or even a dragon. I mean, this is not a little grass snake. This is a deadly serpent. Had he died for the woman, he would not have been able to say that. Why? Well, first of all, because of the tree of life, presumably that he's had, that he's eaten from. He is presumably eaten from the tree of life. I would assume that he did. That's the first thing I would have done. So he's, I would assume that he's eaten from the tree of life. Oh, by the way, he is completely innocent and without sin. Translated, he can't die. Or at the very least, he can't stay dead. You can't kill sinless life. And had he given up his life right there, we don't know what would have happened. But he did it. His vocation, the whole purpose for his existence as a man, and in fact, I'm going to speak to the men in the room, our whole reason for existence is to lay down our lives for our brides. That is why we exist. I would go so far as to say that is the fundamental reason why we exist. To lay down our lives. And our first father failed. He said nothing. He did nothing. He sat by and washed it off. And that is why it talks about Adam's sin. The sin of inaction. The sin of cowardice. The sin of selfishness. But he was silent when his body was threatened by the serpent. And so Adam fell on the eighth day. Let's go over here. I'll come back to this one in a second. Let's go over here. Now in the Gospel of John, we're up on the hill of Calvary. There's a new tree. It's the cross. And the cross, we're told and we know and we believe the cross has become the tree of life. And just as the first tree of life and the first garden was meant to be the center of everything, so in our lives too, the new tree of life, the cross, is meant to be at the center of everything. In our first little episode, our main actors were Adam, the woman, and the serpent. Here, in our second go-around, we have Jesus, who now we know to be the new Adam. Mary, who said yes when Eve said no, is the new Eve. Both of them sinless, by the way. This is why another reason why the Immaculate Conception is so important. The first drama had two immaculately conceived, if you will, immaculate human beings given a choice. Now, once again, we have two immaculate human beings being given a choice. Because Mary's fiat, her yes, and the annunciation, she has to give another yes here. Jesus' yes to his heavenly Father has to be joined by the yes of a woman. So we have the new Adam, the new Eve. And now we have Satan once again trying to get both of them. So we have the dragon. That ancient serpent. Only this time, Adam, the new Adam, is going to do what the first Adam should have. He's going to let the serpent strike him instead of the woman. He's going to give his own life for his bride. And by doing so, he's going to crush the serpent's head. You will strike his heel. 
he will crush your head. And that's exactly what happens here in Calvary. You're talking about being naked without shame. The one final indignity that we simply never can seem to bring ourselves to submit Jesus to is the indignity of nakedness. But he would have been stripped naked on the cross. We're usually, we, we can't bring ourselves to do that, so we'll usually spare him a loin cloth. The Romans wouldn't have done that. So the new Adam, by the tree, facing down the ancient serpent, is now naked without shame on our behalf. On the sixth day, on Friday. And like the first man, he's cast into a deep sleep. He dies. So blood and water pours from his side. He stabbed with the lance, blood and water pour forth. That could be having a number of different things. Sacraments, yes. The Holy Spirit, yes. The birth of the church, yes. When we say that the church was born in that moment, this blood on the porch poured from the heart of Jesus Christ from his own side. Another thing to look up is Ezekiel 47. It talks about blood, or excuse me, water flowing from the right side of the temple. Because Jesus is not just priest and victim, he is also the new temple. Which is another thing that we haven't had a chance to explore in John when it's there. But that's in Ezekiel 47. I think it's 47. It's close to 47. It's close to Ezekiel 47. I'm off. The blood and water gush forth from the heart. And just as the first time was cast into deep sleep, his side was opened up, a rib was taken out. And the bride was fashioned from that rib. Jesus breathes his last. His side is opened up on the sixth day. Blood and water for pour out. That blood and water is the blood of the Eucharist and the water of baptism. The water of the Holy Spirit. It's the birth of the church, the bride of Christ. Before that happens, of course, there's one last thing because Adam does give a name to his wife. Doesn't he? Doesn't he call her Eve? Which means life. Because he says she will be the mother of all the living. What did Jesus say to his mother? Woman, behold your son. And John in that moment stands in for each and every one of us. Sees Mary as his mother because she is going to become the mother of all of the living, all of those who are going to receive the gift of eternal life. And he receives her on our behalf. So the new Eve, as the first Eve, becomes the mother of all the living, right before the first Adam lays down his life for us, and the second Adam lays down his life for us. Of course, that's not how the story is. We'll get to that next week. But just as Adam fell on the eighth day, we hear that on the first day of the week, we're going to show up at the tomb. But there are only seven days of the week, so what day is that? The eighth day. So as the first Adam fell on the eighth day, the new Adam, Jesus Christ, on the eighth day will rise. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. All glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
go in 